If you have been following the crisis in Ukraine, you likely know it has something to do with Ukraine wanting to join the NATO alliance and Russia not being happy about it. But let's talk more about a mechanism that likely contributed to Russia's decision to start the war and what has been done historically to mitigate the temptation. The first thing that you need to know about alliances is that they shift the balance of power in favor of the group and away from the group's competitors. There are many reasons for this, but here are just a couple. For starters, the alliance can coordinate how exactly to deploy its armies in the event of a war. This represents an improvement over coalitions that form in the middle of a war because they do not need to come up with their strategies on the fly. Second, they can specialize in their division of labor. For example, the United States did not build any minesweepers in the Belgium and Netherlands had that burden shifted to them. Similarly, the United States has only two Arctic-capable icebreakers because it can rely on Canada's nine. Specialization allows for more military goods to be produced and therefore more military power for the alliance. The downside here is that obtaining the benefits from an alliance can take time. This is obvious for the construction of specialized weapons. You can't just pluck tanks off of trees. But it also applies to coordinating battle strategies. For instance, the 1894 Franco-Russian alliance took three and a half years to fully iron out. We can see how this creates an incentive for Russia to initiate a war in today's world. Suppose that under the current balance of power, Russia could expect to capture this portion of Ukrainian territory. In a war, everything to the left stays Ukraine, and everything to the right goes to Russia. We can let the military planners decide exactly where this line should be. The point is that it is relatively favorable to Russia because Ukraine is on its own. However, war comes with costs. We can incorporate Russia's cost here with this red line. The area between the white and red lines represents the price of lost lives and capital for Russia converted to square miles of land. Now imagine what would happen if Ukraine joined NATO. With the additional power of the alliance, Ukraine would expect to win more. We can also represent Ukraine's future cost of war with this yellow line. And with that, you might begin to spot the problem by fighting now. Before an alliance can form, Russia expects to secure up to here net its costs. Looking toward the future, we can see that we are in trouble at a later date. The best possible settlement Russia could extract out of a NATO-backed Ukraine must still leave Ukraine with at least this much. But these respective demands are not compatible. Russia would prefer a war in the present. Such a conflict is called a preventive war. When one state initiates a fight to forestall a power shift, and as an explanation for conflict, it is as old as ancient Greece and the Peloponnesian War. But wars in the shadow of this type of alliance formation are commonplace in world history as well. Think back to the American Civil War. The traditional start of this conflict is the battle over Fort Sumter on April 12, 1861. By that time, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas had passed succession resolutions. However, nobody died during the battle, and Lincoln's next move was to decelerate the conflict in hope of reaching a settlement. The Union imposed a blockade on the Confederacy, aiming to starve out their economy and supplies. But Lincoln did not restrict the Union to the blockade forever. The invasion began on July, with the Battle of Bull Run a full three months after Fort Sumter. What changed the Union's policy? One important concern that led to the switch in strategy was Khan. Great Britain relied on Southern Khan for their manufacturing sector. 79% of its imports came from across the Atlantic. This economic interest led British Foreign Secretary and later Prime Minister John Russell to warn the Union that he was in no hurry to recognize the separation as complete and final, but that Great Britain must hold herself free to act according to the progress of events as circumstances might require. The possibility that Britain might recognize the Confederacy or, worse, form a military alliance with a weight on President Lincoln and Secretary of State William Seward on June 3. Seward wrote that the principal danger in the present insurrection was that of foreign intervention, aid or sympathy, and especially of such intervention, aid or sympathy on the part of the government of Great Britain. Bull Run was a way to forestall that. Another apparent preventive war occurred in 2008 between Russia and Georgia. The story here starts in April in Bucharest, where NATO was holding its annual summit. Since the 2003 Rose Revolution, Georgia had sought to become a member of NATO. In 2004, NATO gave Georgia an individual partnership action plan, an early set of terms and conditions that would serve as the prerequisites for joining the alliance. The most historically important of these was that Georgia resolved two separatist claims within its territory, both in the north. By the time of the 2008 meeting, President George W. Bush wanted to give Georgia a membership action plan the process that would actually allow them to join the alliance. NATO decided to put this on their agenda for the next meeting in December. This did not sit well with Vladimir Putin, 
Two days after the summit ended, Russia extended diplomatic relations to both of those separatist regions. This, in turn, created a direct problem with the 2004 requirement that Georgia resolve its separatist claims, and by August the war had started. The good news here is that there are a couple of ways to avoid war. One way is to simply buy the opponent's tolerance of the alliance. This is what happened following the fall of the Berlin Wall. As Germany sought to unify the Soviet Union worried about the implications of NATO taking its first step eastward, the West had a simple solution to the problem, throw money at it. Helmut Kohl, armed with a seemingly endless supply of Deutschmarks, offered giant loans to the Soviet Union. With the Soviet Union in disarray, Gorbachev had little alternative but to accept the former lands of East Germany were now a part of NATO. An alternative strategy is to limit the extent of the alliance benefits. This is part of why the Sino-American American Mutual Defense Treaty did not induce mainland China to initiate a preventive war. Although the pact covered the defense of Taiwan it deliberately left out Taiwan's island possessions near the mainland coast. These will later become the subject of the second Taiwan Strait crisis. Of course, we now know that none of these strategies worked out. Part of the problem is that despite ample effort to create international law there is no central enforcement mechanism that functions around the globe. And given that it's possible that Russia just figured that this is what the world looks like and chose to initiate a war. I hope you found this video helpful, and if you did please like share and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.